Welcome to the Bible and Theology Matters podcast, where we discuss all things Bible and theology. Because it matters, what you really believe determines how you really behave. Now, here is your host, Associate Professor of Bible Exposition at Dallas Theological Seminary and Professor of Bible and Theology for the National Theological College and Graduate School, Dr. Paul Weaver. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, whatever time it is when you are listening to this podcast. I'm your host, Paul Weaver. I have the wonderful privilege each week of leading conversations about Bible and theology with some of my favorite Bible scholars and Bible expositors. I'm pleased to have Dr. Corey Marsh and Dr. James Fazio back on the Bible and Theology Matters podcast to continue our conversation about the contents of their recently published book entitled Discovering Dispensationalism. This book provides a history of dispensational thought from the New Testament era up until the modern era. In the first episode in this three-part podcast series, we discussed some of the misconceptions of dispensationalism and then surveyed the history of dispensational thought from the New Testament era until the Nicene era. In last week's episode, we surveyed the history of dispensational thought in Europe from the medieval era until the time of a key popularizer of dispensational thought, none other than John Nelson Darby. Well, in today's program, we will discuss dispensational thought in modern America. It will be a fascinating discussion. And to have that discussion, I'm pleased to have Dr. Marsh on the program. Dr. Marsh serves as professor of New Testament at Southern California Seminary. My second guest is Dr. James Fazio. Dr. Fazio is the Dean of Bible and Theology at Southern California Seminary. He also serves as professor of biblical studies. Please join me and listen in on our previously recorded conversation. Dr. Mars, chapter nine of your book is entitled Transition Across the Atlantic and subtitled American Bible Conference Movement. We've talked about the grassroots a little bit. Would you please summarize the impact of the Bible Conference Movement and the grassroots nature of dispensationalism? Absolutely. You know, this is an important part of our book. There has to be some type of linchpin that brings dispensational thought to America when, as you see in the book, it progresses from ancient Mediterranean into vintage Europe. And now how do we get to American forms of dispensationalism, which we're most familiar with here? Well, something happened, right? From dispensational thought in vintage Europe to morph into these expressions of dispensationalism today in the U.S. We are now in an era of dispensational thought in modern America. Well, that needs to be traced. There needs to be a bridge, some type of link. And Larry Pettigrew, is who we assigned for this chapter, invited to be a part of it, and he graciously accepted to be part of this project because he's an expert on this particular era of the American Bible Conference movement. And that's what he shows brought the ideas, really, of Darby and others, but from the from Europe over to America. So he wrote the chapter that covers 1875 to the year 1910, entitled Translation Across the Atlantic, the American Bible Conference movement. John Nelson Darby made multiple trips to North America between 1862 and 1877, I believe. And also George Needham is in this chapter. His arrival in the United States in 1868, they played key roles in introducing a new audience to the persuasive prophecy conference model, which had initiated so many audiences across the Atlantic to dispensational ideas. Things like premillennialism, the pre-tribulational rapture. You know, these American audiences were now more interested in eschatology than all of, say, Darby's ideas, but that's what really took hold. And so premillennialism gets a huge jump. Pre-tribulational rapture Rapture, the theological arrangement of God's dealings with man according to su successive dispensations. This is where it really starts becoming systematized and becoming a recognized pattern of beliefs under a particular theology, which would be called later, be called dispensationalism. And most prominently, the American Bible Conference movement brought a new concern in eschatology as we're talking, or last things, and specifically the idea of literal prophetic fulfillment surrounding the second coming of Christ. So guys like George Needham, one of the founders of the Bible Conference movement in America, the Niagara Bible Conference in particular is probably the most well-known. And out of this movement arose, which many people refer to as the father of American dispensationalism, that is James Hall Brooks. 
We have a Bible college to this day named after him, the Brooks Bible College, right? In time, that mantle of leadership of the Niagara Bible Conference fell on who we would think is the most important man in the history of American dispensational premillennialism, at least, and that's James Brooks. In addition to being a, a Presbyterian pastor, he also served as the president of the Niagara Bible Conference. And afterward, the Seacliff Bible Conference was established with familiar leaders like Arno Gabeline and C.I. Schofield, along with other prophetic and academic conferences were happening at this time. It just became explosive around the United States. And during this period and following, as a result of the American Bible Conference movement, several dispensational doctrines became solidified as a core pattern of beliefs, which would soon after be labeled dispensationalism. Things like literal hermeneutics, prophecy, an emphasis on the inspiration and inerrancy of scripture really got a foothold during this time. History progressing via different dispensations or economies or administrations, the pre-tribulational rapture, a future for Israel, and of course, premillennialism. These became staple beliefs in the eschatology of the time through the American Bible Conference movement, which took their cue from Darby and others and the prophetic conferences in Ireland and England beforehand. So it's a very, very important chapter. It shows doctrinally that development, how it happens from European or what we call vintage European dispensational thought to more familiar expressions here in America. It is through that American Bible Conference movement. That's very good, very helpful. Taking the natural laws of communication. What did the ritual author intend to communicate to the ritual recipients? How did Abraham understand the covenant given to him? Reading the scripture as originally intended by the big A author God using the little a author authors, the prophets, and the apostles, it leads us to a dispensational understanding of a literal interpretation of the tribulation and the Antichrist and the pre-tribulational rapture and a literal 1,000 year reign of Christ. And of course, a lot of the Bible institutes that became Bible colleges and liberal arts schools in the United States, many of them also influenced by the Bible conference mm -hmm. movement and started Bible institutes and became right. four-year colleges. And Dow Seminary, of course, was heavily influenced by Chafer and others that were involved in a lot of these Bible conference situations. In this era, the what we hold to is the, the doctrine of inerrancy really grabbed grabbed a hold of during this American Bible Conference movement. It wasn't that that that's necessarily a dispensational distinction. It's not because all Orthodox evangelical Christians hold to the inerrancy of Scripture. At least they should. Now, how they define that might be a little bit different. But that high view of Scripture, although it's not like dispensationalists hold the monopoly on that, but they should be given their credit because there was during the, these Bible Conference movements because mm -hmm. it was part of the staple of things taught on eschatology, that we're going to believe these things are true to happen because God's word is inerrant. And out of that would develop into a fully sophisticated doctrine of inerrancy that would, you know, be signed by over 300, uh, you know, signees in, in the 1970s, what we call the Chicago Statement of Biblical Inerrancy. Mm -hmm. And by that time, not everybody was dispensational on that, right. that council at all. It was trans-denominational and trans-tradition, but it can, credit should be given. You can trace it back to the American Bible Conference movement. That was a core belief that really solidified the eschatology and the fervor in eschatology. People were passionate about it because it was equally taught that God's work can be understood, it's authoritative, and it is inerrant. So we can expect these things to happen. So they kind of go hand in glove, dispensational yeah. ideas and eschatology along with inerrancy. Well, one one last thing that I think is fascinating. During those days, there were a lot of Presbyterians, premillennialists. Dr. Ryrie, in my interviews with him, he spoke of Barnhouse in Philadelphia, the Presbyterian that was a dispensationalist. And, and I was talking to my wife's grandmother, who was in the Peoria area, and Grace Press there every year would have a prophecy conference. And they brought in Dwight Pentecost and Walverd and, and the rest. So unfortunately, there's very few Presbyterians that would be dispensational today and dispensationalists. So that's sad, but it's also interesting to note and to make note that there were dispensationalists within Presbyterian denominations. Well, there sure was. In fact, in our last chapter, we talked about why there's such a bright future for dispensationalism is that it transcends denominations. It always has. It's been interdenominational and even non-denominational since its beginning. As you mentioned, there were more Presbyterian. James Hall Brooks was Presbyterian. Mm -hmm. Lewis Berry Chafer never, mm -hmm. never, re never rescinded his, his Presbyterian ordination or his credentials. He remained to Presbyterian his whole life. C.I. Schofield was Congregationalist and Presbyterian, depending on the church that he that he was at. John Nelson Darby remained an Anglican his whole life. W. Griffith 
Cliff Thomas, one of the co-founders of Dallas Seminary with Chafer, he remained an Anglican. So there was Anglicans, Presbyterians, there was Methodists, Baptists, of course, and of course, Independents, which is what gives credence, I think, to the robust living tradition of dispensationalism. It's not shackled or constrained to a specific church tradition. It is inductive straight from the Bible itself, which speaks to all denominations. Well, Dr. Fazio, Dr. Tommy Ice, you invited to write the next chapter. He's the executive director of the Pre-Trib Research Center and organizes the annual Pre-Tribulational Study Group that I've had the privilege of giving a presentation at last year. He was given the fun task of writing the chapter entitled Golden Years of Dispensationalism, subtitled Schofield to Lindsay. Two very interesting names put together there, mm -hmm. Schofield and Lindsay. Would you highlight some of the most important concepts developed in that chapter? Well, that's usually the period that I think most people who are familiar with dispensationalism today associate with the idea. They are familiar with Dallas Theological Seminary's proliferation of dispensationalism through men like Charles Ryrie, J. Dwight Pentecost, John Walvoord, Lewis Berry Chafer. Obviously, the Schofield Reference Bible introduced dispensationalism to North American audiences like no other. I mean, there is no parallel to the proliferation of dispensational, you know, the seven successive dispensational arrangement of history scheme presented embedded in the study notes of the Schofield Study Bible. And then what Lewis Berry Chafer did with the, the systematic theology that became a, a mainstay text for Dallas Seminary for a generation. It defined the Bible church movement, the general Baptistic you know, what we associate today with and how we commonly understand dispensationalism. You have an entire generation that kind of, you know, cut its teeth on the Schofield Reference Bible. And then dispensationalism was taught as a sort of a de facto position for many budding ministers who ended up in pulpits all over America and it just became prolific. So most people were dispensationalists and didn't even know why and may not have even even known mm -hmm. what, what it meant to be so. It was the default position. So that was the significance of that period and why it's called the golden years. Not that dispensationalism made its greatest achievements, but it, it absolutely made its broadest saturation of the culture. And so that's, that's the idea there. It's when it had sway on the culture, on the, I'm American mindset from everything from pulpits to public policy. And, and so that's why it's, it's as far really, as we're, as far as like Reagan and Israel, he believed in a literal future for Israel. That's right. Yeah, absolutely. It influenced culture. That's why you take it to Lindsay, how Lindsay, when you consider fiction novels were like great planet earth, the American imagination and the newspaper reading with the expectation of the fulfillment of the book of revelation right around the corner you know and then of course media i mean it's also it also coincides nicely with television and movies just media as americans consume it a thief in the night was that in the yes 80s yep. i think yeah. 70s or 60s 70s? late 60s yeah. late 60s yeah. actually yeah. well we're still watching it in the early 80s when mm -hmm. i remember my mother took me to that at her church it was scary for a six-year-old. Paul, you saw that as a kid. I did too. I remember with my with my parents and terrified of, of it. I mean, there was there was like a scene of a guillotine behind like a shopping center or something. Yeah. Like, oh, good grief! This is so scary. This is so real. Like, and, yeah. And yeah, that was a that was a terrifying movie. You know, what? <laughs> I I remember the guillotine as well. I think we left right after that, but it was traumatizing yeah. to a young yeah. boy. Yeah. So you mentioned how Lindsay, because of this sensational approach, I assume is the emphasis here, right? You're going from the scholarly to the sensational and yeah that particular chapter by the way so when it gets into the popular level stuff which has to be mentioned so tommy ice even talks about the the jesus movement at a calvary chapel in that period as james said it's so widespread very influential in american culture in different ways that chapter is unique because it's showing both the scholastic side and the scholastics that came out of it like walvert and ryrie and pentecost that were making incredible inroads for academic dispensationalism at the same time that pop dispensationalism and was taking hold 
most critics of dispensationalism will focus just on one of those, the popular level, late great planet Earth. So there's there's Lindsay. You got to put his name in there because it gives a nice hole marker, if you will. Yeah. They're going to focus just on that to the exclusion of what was also happening at the time. And unfortunately, I would say, and this is just me, but yeah, that popular level, whether it's you know late great planet Earth or even a thief in the night or even later the Left Behind series, which was based on certain truth. There's no doubt about mm-hmm. it. But it it took such liberalities and it overwhelmed and overshadowed the scholarly side that that's all it became known, that era for this mockery nowadays to be able to mock this popular level stuff. When at the same time, there was incredible scholarship happening that was trying to distance themselves from that part. ISIS chapter does a wonderful job showing both happening, coalescing at the same time and the results that happened from it. So we want to be even handed. We we don't want to be sensational. We want to go where the Bible tells us. And when we're taking some creative creative license in novels and such, we, or even in our preaching, we need to indicate that, right? For all the, let's say, good that the original, say, the Left Behind series, which Tim LaHaye was a brilliant theologian, as well as his political involvement and things, but there was a lot of good that was in that particular series, those books. I know two people and, got saved through it. One sure. through the book, one yeah. through a video. And those stories, those testimonies are common. Even I, I my, my mom, I remember telling me she got saved by reading Hal Lindsey's Late Great Planet Earth. You know, mm-hmm. it, it for forced her back to the Bible to, to see these things. So there's a lot of good that came out of it. There's no doubt about it. But there's also a lot of, there's a lot of bad because of the licensing, you know, the liberalities taken with that went beyond scripture. And so now we have, even as professors at a dispensational school, we have students that aren't dispensational. They learn about it at our school. But oftentimes, like I've had papers, I'm grading them and they're quoting lines from left behind <laughs> to make their case, <laughs> not, not, you know, not the Bible. And, you know, they're obviously going to be graded down down because of it and, and corrected and hey we got to be exegetical know where the know where the popular level stuff is the entertainment stuff is and where the biblical data actually you know what how that informs us and we got to make that clear distinction unfortunately too many of the pop level fringe entertainment influence dispensationalists if we can call them that they've just taken the popular level entertainment side of it and overshadowed everything else and we as dispensationalists even academic dispensationalists we push away from that as well so we are just inductive staying into scripture there might be movement Movies, Nicolas Cage might be playing another, you know, role in a Left Behind series that embarrasses us too. Let's get back to just scripture, I mean, that's what we as dispensationalists really hold dear. You know, just what what's the inductive biblical data tell us? And I don't think it's done a lot of well. I don't think it's done a lot of harm at the local church level. It's mainly us scholars as exegetes and theologians that have to deal with the kickback. I think there are more dispensationalists as a result of Left Behind series than any theological textbook written. Yeah, there probably are. And then, you know, we would also want to refine and correct right. things that, you know, aren't specifically dispensational and bring it back to what is dispensational and what's what's the liberality being taken here. So, you know, it's, it's, it's one of those double-edged swords. But I agree with you. I think it's probably more good than bad. But there are some, some unfortunate parts that we find ourselves as dispensational scholars having to constantly correct. Sure. And it originated in some popular level idea that's not specifically in the Bible. Which is a reminder how influential books like The Shack or Da Vinci Code, all anything written at a popular level, that's the vast majority of people are reading at a popular level. And we may think, you know, in the seminaries and colleges are making huge dent, but oftentimes it's the popular works that are the most influential. I'm glad you brought that up, Paul, because I will take the errors in Left Behind series any day over the errors in the shack. <laughs> you, know? <laughs> right. you know, so there are far more theologically dangerous books written on a popular yeah. level that are non-dispensational, like The Shack or The Da Vinci Code. These things are just absolutely horrific yeah. and mutilate, you know, true biblical theology. I also think we do have a lot of charismatics and Pentecostals that are pre-tribulational and pre-millennial and believe a literal future for Israel in the land. And so those are obviously significant components of dispensational approach and and more sensational as well. So that can also make it harder, again, to sift through the sensational and the Mm -hmm. technical. It does. And this is why like dispensationalism is not, it's not constrained to a certain denomination. In just a moment, we'll return to our previously recorded podcast. But first, let me share with you our Missions Minute of the Week. Today, we'll be hearing from Rachel in the country of Lebanon, who is a graduate of the National Theological College and Graduate School, also known as NTCGS. 
Hello everyone, I'm Rachel, I'm from Lebanon. I have started to study theology at NTCGS four years ago. I started with very little biblical knowledge, but after four years of study, NTCGS has gave me a clear and biblical understanding of the Christian doctrines. Now I have a solid biblical foundation and ready to defend my faith in Jesus and talk about the reason of my hope. Now in my ministry, I'm leading many groups of Bible study. They are ladies from Muslim background, also Christian ladies coming from ritual churches and I give them Bible study lessons. I also give counseling sessions for women who are suffering, who are facing many problems in their family or in their society, in their surroundings. I encourage you to support NTCGS because they are doing a great job in glorifying God and in giving students a solid knowledge about Jesus and about the scripture. The National Theological College and Graduate School is a strategically placed school with three campuses in the Middle East and one in East Africa. To learn more about how you can partner with NTCGS in equipping future leaders of the Church of Jesus Christ, like Rachel, in Lebanon, Egypt, Syria, Jordan, and East Africa, please visit ntcgs.org. That's ntcgs.org. Org. Now, let's return to our previously recorded conversation. Well, let's talk about your next chapter as we walk through your book entitled Discovering Dispensationalism, Tracing the Development of Dispensational Thought from the First to the 21st Century. Dr. Marsh, you include a chapter on what is called Mid-Axe Movement, and most of our listeners have probably never heard of this group. Would you tell us why you decided to include this chapter in your book and then explain what is the Mid-Axe Movement? Yeah, so our book is very unique for several reasons. This chapter is one of them. As you said, most people have never heard of mid-axe dispensationalism. If they have heard of it, it's generally by a more crude term, such as hyper-dispensationalism or ultra-dispensationalism, as Charles Wright referred to it. But we have included it in our book because we do believe that it deserves a place at the table in this discussion of how American dispensational thought sort of branched off in different areas. And they have made significant impacts on dispensationalism as a whole. And it's interesting because you see the timelines, like we actually, we were a little conflicted. Do we put the golden years first and then the mid-axe chapter or the mid-axe chapter first and then the golden years one? Well, because the ages the, mm -hmm. that we're talking about coalesce. And so we put, I believe, mid-axe dispensationalism chapter, uh, the chapter before the golden years, just because we're going to start, as the chapter does, with the first early voice, E.W. Bollinger in the mid-1800s or late 1800s, rather. Our chapter was written by a firsthand representation. And that's another thing. So our chapters are written by those who are experts in a specific era or belong to that particular tradition of dispensationalism that's being spoken of. So this is one of them. Like Tommy Ice, who was much involved in the golden years of dispensationalism, being at Dallas Seminary during this time. The chapter on mid-axe dispensationalism is written by Philip Long, who is a scholar, a New Testament professor out of Grace Christian University, which is a school birthed out of this mid-axe movement. So mid-axe dispensational theology in the chapter, the acronym MADT, it's also referred to in some areas as grace theology. And they have schools and institutes like Grace Christian University, which was originally Milwaukee Bible Institute, I believe. Today, the active scholars within this tradition be Philip Long, as I mentioned, Dale DeWitt, who is older, you know, he's pushing 90 by now, but has written some wonderful works. They have a peer-reviewed journal, the Journal of Grace Theology. It's called Mid-Acts because what they do is they source the current dispensation of grace that we're in now with the ministry of the Apostle Paul. And so mid-Acts is generally about where either, whether it's Paul's conversion or his ministry to the Gentiles, where do we place this new economy of grace? They're going to source it with the Apostle Paul and sometime within his ministry. And that's why it's referred to as mid-Acts, somewhere in the mid part of Acts. The most extreme, like E.W. Bollinger, would place it all after Paul's ministry in the end of Acts. So probably the most controversial positions they have, water baptism. For most mid-axe dispensationalists, they do not believe is a Christian rite or a Christian practice. The reason being that Paul never baptized anybody, or he didn't command it at least. And they're going to source the letters that are most applicable for the church within Paul's letters, and there's no command to be baptized. That was in the Gospels, as Jesus gave his Jewish disciples. So they're going to say water baptism is not necessary for the Christian. The most extreme are going to go in and say the Lord's Supper, communion, is not a Christian rite also. Depending on which part of Paul's ministry they're sourcing the or 
origin of the current dispensation. So there's some disagreement there. But what they do do is they base their positions not on these novel ideas to start with. They are reading the Bible consistently literal as possible. And when they see distinctions like Paul being an apostle to the Gentiles and Peter being one to the circumcised or to the Jewish people, they have made a lot of inroads in calling attention to specific details and distinctions that the New Testament makes that most people just gloss right over, whether you agree with them or not. And they're producing some pretty sound literature. So we were very happy to have Phil Long, who was a primary expert in it. He is a mid-axe dispensationalist himself who's published wonderful books. He's got one that was huge that took off on the Book of Enoch, an introductory work on Enoch. He's written a commentary on Galatians that I provided endorsement for. So I thought it was very well done. Don't agree with everything that he says or, or what this movement says, but it is interesting historically, and it did happen within the United States. And so that's why it's within our book, especially in that section on dispensational thought in modern America. It deserves a place to be able to tell their story and let readers decide what they think of it. We are proud to have it in our book. Nowhere will you see a dispensational work with all these contributors. In fact, we didn't even tell the other contributors who each contributor was because there was probably a good reason why they wouldn't want to be on the same book with some of, <laughs> some of these guys. So all our authors are being surprised right now when they see the finished product and they see who's before them and after them. <laughs> but we're glad to have the chapter and it's very well written. Ignoring it on our side would raise some eyebrows as it should. It's like, well, what are you going to do with this movement? This is And they're, and they're still here and they have, they have a unit university and they have a journal and they have actually some really good scholarship. I have benefited much from Dale DeWitt's dispensational in the 20th century. I forgot the full title, but it's an excellent scholarly study. Don't agree with all of his positions. Even if we disagree on some of these positions, they are represented well with some other scholars. And we were proud to be able to feature that particular era and that movement in our book. And it's Bollinger that's the source for figures of speech, right? That many people yeah. still reference. How yes. ironic is that? Here's the guy that's an extreme <laughs> dispensation, the most literal that you can find, and yet everybody appeals to his figures of speech in the Bible. He has over a thousand metaphors. So when, when that accusation is shown that you dispensationalists are so literal, you don't understand metaphors or symbols or figures of speech in the Bible, we absolutely do. In fact, E.W. Bollinger, who I would totally disagree with on so many positions, was an extreme version of a dispensationalist, and he wrote the seminal work on figures of speech used in the Bible that most scholars have on their shelves, not even realizing that he was an extreme dispensationalist. Very good. Well, Dr. Fazio, you also included a chapter on progressive dispensationalism, and my colleague here at Dallas Theological Seminary was the contributor, Dr. Daryl Bach. Would you summarize his contribution in this chapter to this book? Absolutely. I think what is important, it's already sort of been touched on with the mid-axe dispensationalism. And because we're tracing dispensational thought, it becomes necessary to consider the significance of progressive dispensationalism, which today becomes many people's understanding or familiarity with dispensationalism may simply be reduced to what their reading of Daryl Bach, Greg Blazing, Bob Sosi, the variant in his latest form of dispensationalism that many are familiar with. It becomes important to show the diversity of the tradition, that dispensationalism has never been monolithic, even in the so-called golden years. You almost couldn't get the same position from any two dispensationalists at the time concerning the significance of the new covenant, who it related to, how many new covenants, David's throne, the relationship between the kingdom of God, kingdom of heaven. I mean, all these themes have been debated because when you don't have a, a single person. And this is unique about dispensational theology. You know, it's not named after a man. It's not mm. called Darby theology. You know, it's not like Calvinism or Arminianism or something like that. It's, it's not codified by one person. It's not stamped in, in stone and repeated. That's not the nature of, of dispensational theology. It is a diverse tradition that is reflected out of the biblical text that everybody approaching that text is going to see different things. And it's why the discussion is so important. And even among dispensationalists and non-dispensationalists, it's very important to listen to those who don't read the scripture the same way we do and say, are 
are we seeing too much here? Are we seeing too little? This is really, I think, the legacy of progressive dispensationalists is that it shows in many ways since about the 1980s, progressive dispensationalists have been almost the only voice that others have heard or are familiar with, at least in, in, in recent decades. So that's why it is important to sort of end on that note to show it not only have we traced a development, but it's continuing to to develop. And as we've already noted, different authors will have different opinions about the extent to which this variation or that variation is to be preferred. You know, that's that's not really the purpose of the book. The purpose of the book is to show the diversity within the tradition. Very good. Well, Dr. Marsh, final chapter in your book provides a helpful summary and analysis of all that you accomplished in this book. As we wrap up our discussion, remind our listeners what you wished to accomplish and whether, in your opinions, you accomplished it, and finally, what has been the feedback from it so far? We make it very clear in the first chapter what our goal is. As someone who writes book reviews a lot, and you're always looking for, okay, where's the thesis? Who's your audience? What's the goal you want to be able to, you know, some authors are very unclear with that. We were overly clear with them. We even have section headings, you know, our audience, our goal, all of those types of things, so you know what we're, we're aiming at. One thing is that this is not an apologetic for dispensationalism, and it's not a polemic for, we're not preaching dispensationalism, and we're not even giving the truth value to dispensationalism, although that starts to happen maybe in that final chapter. Our goal is far more modest. What we're showing is basically what one of our esteemed endorsers for the book, David Bebbington, wrote about our book, that it shows that elements of dispensational theology were in every period preceding John Nelson Darby, because the biggest mischaracterization is that dispensationalism is new, it's recent, it was invented in the mind of an evil genius, whatever. We are showing, without any doubt, interacting with primary evidence, these ideas that would later be codified under dispensationalism have existed since the New Testament itself that these are not novel ideas. They're not recent ideas. They developed over time and became refined over time, but they're ancient and they're historical. So our goal is to show the historical veracity. Now, obviously we're dispensationalists, so we're going to believe it's a true system as well, but that's not the goal. The goal is to show the historical veracity and pedigree of dispensational thought. So the, whatever critique you have of dispensationalism, one thing this book will not allow you to say is that it's a recent invention and that nobody before this era held to to a literal hermeneutic, or nobody held to a pre-trib rapture before Darby, or nobody held to a distinction between church and Israel before this time. We see these ideas throughout ancient Mediterranean, into Europe, into modern America, around the globe. These things were always around. And so that, that is our goal. And the feedback so far has been, well, it's been quite overwhelming, overwhelmingly positive. It's been wonderful. I know several scholars who are non-dispensational who immediately picked up our book. I've been in some, some really collegial conversations with another author. Our book came Came out at the same time as two major critiques on dispensationalism, one called After Dispensationalism, published by Lexham Press, another called The Rise and Fall of Dispensationalism, published <laughs> by Erdman's. And I've been in contact, you know, Dan Hummel of Rise and Fall of Dispensationalism. His book is very well done. It's a historical cultural study of dispensationalism. Ours is a history of doctrinal development. So two different angles. But we've had some excellent conversations and he picked up the book and, and has appreciated and even uh, has suggested there's some things he'd like to refine and revise in his own book based on ours. is that ours came out just a, a little bit after his. I don't have much else to say than what he already said. I, I would just suggest that our hope is humble. We don't expect to change people's perspective. A lot of people's minds already made up concerning how dispensationalism started in the 19th century in the mind of John Nelson Darby, and they'll repeat that to their graves. So I don't expect a seismic shift, but for those who are intellectually curious and want to understand better the historical pedigree of dispensational thought and to trace the ideas concerning the rapture, the appearing of the Antichrist, the tribulation period on the earth, the seven-year period, the millennial kingdom of Christ set up on, on the earth, the restoration of Israel in terms of uh, eschatological perspective, and just the arrangement of history on the basis of God's stewardship, arrangements with man arranged around the idea of responsibility and the demonstration of God's grace throughout history. These things are there for those who would want to look for them. 
And to simply provide a source where people can go and hear from historians who have done the hard work, they've done the heavy lifting, to put that kind of thing together in one place is, it's a handy work to have on your shelves mm-hmm. and to be able to use, whether it's as a reference work when the questions arise or to read through, because it is about a 400 page, but it's a summary of each period, just one chapter on each period. So it does move fairly quickly. I think it could be a valuable resource for many who are interested. Well, I sure think so. I sure hope that scholars will reference this, will interact with it in their future works. And I'm thankful for this gift that you've given to dispensationalists as a whole, church historians, and the greater church. Well, our time is up for today's episode, but we only scratched the surface. So make sure that you jump online and order your own copy of Dr. Marsh and Dr. Fazio's co-edited book published by Southern California Seminary Press entitled Discovering Dispensationalism, subtitled Tracing the Development of Dispensational Thought from the first to the 21st century. Well, I hope you'll join us again next week for another great podcast. And in the meantime, if you like the Bible and Theology Matters podcast, you may also enjoy our six to 10 minute faith affirming findings videos. In them, I describe some of the most important discoveries from the field of biblical archaeology. They will affirm your faith in the historicity of scripture and provide unique insights into the background and culture of the Bible. You can find them on our YouTube channel, which is also called Bible and Theology Matters. Simply go Go to YouTube and in the search engine type Bible and A&D Theology Matters or go to our website and click on the YouTube link. Until next time, never forget Bible and Theology Matters because what you really believe determines how you really behave. Bible and Theology Matters podcast is a listener supported podcast devoted to helping Christians grow in their knowledge of the Word of God and in their relationship to the God of the Word. To learn how you can partner with the Bible and Theology Matters podcast, visit us at BibleAndTheologyMatters.com. That's Bible, A-N-D, TheologyMatters.com.